Um, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, thank you to each, <coughs> sorry, each and every one uh, of you to being here with us. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have been long have been with us for a long time and now as well as those who are new to the interest of speak asian business uh, youth platform and bangladesh youth forum uh, before we get started i would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us to make this webinar come together to become a success asia indigenous people's pact and i am just asia pacific team and our honorable speaker uh, we could not have done it without you. So let's begin our webinar. Now I would like to I invite Ms. Chandra Tripura, Executive Council Members of Asia and Indigenous Peoples Pact to uh, welcome speech on behalf of Asia Indigenous Youth Platform, IMCS Indigenous Youth Commission and Bangladesh Indigenous Youth Forum. So over to you, Chandra. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, William. Um, I'd like to thank IMCA um, for this amazing initiative and uh, for starting this amazing bridge for all indigenous youths around the world and uh, for welcoming Asia Indigenous Youth Platform and Bangladesh Indigenous Youth Forum to uh, being the co-host for this amazing initiative today. Um, we are very uh, honored to have uh, three most uh, inspiration, uh, inspirational role for all indigenous communities, particularly for indigenous youths. Um, Ms. Janine Lesimbang, um, she is one of my, uh, you know, inspiration in my, throughout my life. And uh, of course we have uh, uh, Gam Shimurai, our, um, Secretary General of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, who always, um, you know, who have been a mentor for me in my life and always showing, showering uh, love to all the indigenous um, youths, uh, you know, a, 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 in our way. And also we will have uh, uh, Juan Kerling, um, who is another inspiration for all the indigenous uh, youths who is, we, we always, uh, you know, claim that these three people are the power bank uh, of, for all, all indigenous communities, particularly for indigenous youths again. And we will have uh, our, uh, you know, friend who is not indigenous, but who never let us, she is not among us, uh, Ms. Shuvez from UNESCO. Uh, we are really grateful, uh, you know, to them for joining us today. And uh, this initiative, I, I would say that is really amazing for all indigenous youths. Um, although IMCS has initiated this um, for uh, their network members, uh, for their Christian indigenous youths, and uh, they have recently launched the uh, indigenous um, youth uh, platform, a commission for the uh, Christian indigenous youth. But I strongly believe that this will not just uh, you know, a platform for the um, indigenous youths who are Christians, but for all the indigenous uh, youths uh, around the world. Um, today we will be having uh, you know uh, uh, an amazing discussion uh, by four of you know most in inspirational uh, um, people uh, in our lives on indigenous uh, you know women and men overcoming multiple dimension dimension of uh, marginalization. We uh, clearly know that indigenous peoples uh, face the most, uh, they, they experience throughout their lives, the all kind of uh, marginalization, be it, uh, um, you know, due to geographical location, be it due to uh, gender um, and their uh, se sexual orientation and their age. Uh, and this kind of marginalization actually in, impacts uh, in their in the individual's life um, 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 uh, physically, logically, and uh, emotionally. 
So we will be uh, listening uh, to them and we'll try to learn a lot. And for all the indigenous youths, uh, particularly who have uh, attended this uh, webinar, um, and the, this is actually second phase uh, of the uh, initiative. Uh, the uh, IMCS has organized um, in collaboration with the Asia Indigenous Youth Platform. And uh, for today's uh, webinar, uh, the Bangladesh Indigenous Youth Forum is also another co-host. And I believe that Indigenous youths will be able to learn a lot today through the, these uh, webinars, uh, interventions of um, from uh, Jani, uh, from uh, Joan and uh, Gam, as well as so from Sue's interventions. and. Uh, I, um, you know, this is another, um, uh, we always, uh, you know, uh, our elders always uh, complain some, they actually sometimes complain that indigenous youths, not just indigenous youths, actually young people, they, uh, in this era, they are actually more dependent on the Wikipedia or Google than the elders, uh, where actually our elders or our interested, they used to talk a lot with the um, elders. Um, so I think this is an amazing opportunity for all of us to, you know, um, have more interactive sessions and the uh, you know, not just, uh, we will not just, um, you know, make this, uh, today's webinar, uh, you know, just listening from them, but we'll also uh, ask uh, different questions uh, on the uh, specific agenda to, that we have today. Um, I'm not gonna um, extend my, this much, but uh, I will uh, expect that um, our participants, uh, all the delegates will the opportunity to also interact with uh, our uh, speakers today and uh, we'll be able to learn a lot from them. And I thank um, IMCS again for uh, this, for you know, uh, making this bridge for all indigenous youths, as well as uh, um, uh, you know, uh, organizing this intergenerational dialogue today. Thank you so much. Over to you, William. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chandra, for your welcome mark. So it's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Yeah, now I would like to invite Ms. Jenny Lassimbang, MLA, uh, Sava, Malaysia. And she is a former Secretary General of AIPP and former member of IMRIP to share with us her historical background of becoming a global women leader for indigenous movement by overcoming various obstacles and challenges. Yeah, and uh, she will uh, share with us the importance of participation in national politics for indigenous peoples. Welcome, ma'am. Yeah, it's not so bad to you. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you very much to, um, for this invitation, uh, the Indigenous Youth Platform. Um, indigenous movement of uh, the, the IMCS and also the Bangladesh uh, Indigenous Youth Forum. I'm very pleased to be able to join this and I, I do hope that we are able to, um, you know, share a little bit uh, about what, uh, what uh, the topic is. So uh, uh, briefly, Kopi uh, Posian, uh, greetings to everyone, to all the participants here. I, I understand many are youths, but also you know, students from various uh, countries. Um, <clears throat> for me personally, I mean, I, I didn't know what exactly the uh, need to be shared, but uh, I thought, you know, the experience we have, um, of course for us, uh, we started when it was uh, early uh, in the 80s for me, um, going from my personal experience uh, as a woman also, an uh, indigenous woman activist, um, I think there are very few uh, women at, uh, even, even today uh, who are still very active in, um, uh, you know, going to uh, communities, going to internationally. There's been a lot of uh, increase of uh, people working now in the social uh, in NGO field, but um, just I think starting from where I am uh, in Sabah, uh, 
I, I think one of the key things that I found was the opportunity. If you are an indigenous woman activist, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to actually uh, represent, um, in my case, Malaysia uh, to meetings. And, and that's the start. Uh, we went to many communities in Asia, as uh, well as uh, conferences, UN conferences, uh, and uh, all over the world. I just, for me personally, I love attending the biodiversity conference uh, because it allowed, uh, allowed me to visit uh, different countries. And I think um, uh, being involved in Asia Indigenous Post Pack or AIPP uh, allowed me to you know, stay uh, with communities. And I think these are the things that ground us. Being where we are uh, will ground us uh, into issues that uh, will make us to you know, to help us when we go uh, internationally, learning things and also understanding people. And uh, so, this is my you know sharing for youths who, who are young uh, and who wants to be involved. I I think uh, my involvement in Pakos Trust, uh, a community-based organization, Saba, um, is important. The grounding before we go to. Uh, any of the international meetings to talk about indigenous rights, uh, we need to understand what is happening at the, our own level. So um, often we were, I, I remember growing up being ashamed of who I am as an indigenous person, but actually um, those, uh, understanding those are very important uh, grounding for us. So um, whenever I go to the UN uh, or even a regional conference, I do not have a problem finding ideas to share and talk about. So I think for young people, um, um, those are the things that uh, may be interesting for you. you know? um, language, of course, you know, uh, is often when you go internationally, language is a problem. Uh, but uh, for us who, you know, who studied, of course, English at uh, young, it, it was easier, but maybe now, it, uh, for many, it is diff difficult, no? But there are always interpretation. You can find friends to, or you know, uh, organizations to help you. And I will always say the universal sign language of, of the heart to communicate is is the best. Uh, so you will be over, able to overcome those uh, challenges. Um, actually, I grew up being quite shy, <laughs> and. Um, I find that you have to work very hard. I had to work very hard to be an effective representative, um, especially uh, as time goes on and you are tasked with bigger responsibilities, uh, like you know being a key negotiator. Uh, I remember uh, AIPP, uh, the Asia, Indig Asia Indigenous Peoples, uh, recommended me to be a negotiator for the world the outcome document of the UN World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. I mean huge you have to be in the U, uh, in new york so you know to to be able to um overcome to be able to talk uh, to be an effective representative talking to governments talking to indigenous peoples uh, all over the world is is so important to to be able to uh, to to do that and um uh, i think in the beginning it will be difficult but nothing can be uh, too difficult to, to uh, not a big challenge if we find commonalities and issues with indigenous peoples and you are willing to work together. You be, it becomes very interesting. I found that this is usually how it is. A lot of people, a lot of indigenous people all over the world, when they gather, they are willing to come in uh, and share. Of course, uh, it also means um, you will uh, to synthesize synthesize ideas and demands into a you know a small document uh, is difficult. So you, as a person, you know we grow uh, to share to to be able to listen to others and um, you know the backgrounds and and their key issues. What are their positions? What are the actions that they want to take and uh, put that in a, into a statement or plan of action. Uh, during these uh, uh, these international meetings, and I can tell you that many indigenous leaders can be very vocal, very insistent, and may not be willing to compromise. Um, uh, it could also be complicated by even as an indigenous woman, 
uh, representative, I find also uh, resistance from other male indigenous leaders. And if you go to a, a mix like um, indigenous and non-indigenous uh, meetings, you actually have to, you might find uh, that indigenous issues are really uh, like, you know, really put aside. And um, they, it's one of the issues that are treated very, like not very important to many countries or seen as the, the most controversial uh, issue. Uh, indigenous people's issues are considered very controversial, especially when it comes to land, territories, and resources. They, you know, they, it is considered very uh, uh, conflicting. And I remember, for example, going to Taiwan, and then we were trying to work out, and there are so many issues that they want to take out uh, on human rights. But uh, indigenous, when it comes to indigenous issues, everybody is, uh, all the government, as well as the, even the experts, uh, will uh, tend to put down uh, indigenous issues. Okay, um, I, uh, on a personal, going back to personal uh, experience again, um, actually I started uh, getting involved in indigenous issues in 1984 when I was just 21 years old. And during our university days, um, I was involved like in the Christian union, but you know, it, that time it was more focused on uh, religious or you know issues and uh, at that time so I to me um, it's good it's great to start uh, when we are young and I hope as young people um, you can be inspired to join uh, indigenous um, uh, movements uh, I find it uh, now when I'm almost 60 years old <laughs> uh, traveling long distance travel and walking uh, it's not very convenient no? <laughs> it's, it's very tough uh, those days um, are easy you no know? five ten hours flight is easy but uh, um, that's why when you're young and you're fit uh, and you are there's more time for you you know uh, maybe no families to to you know to the responsibilities so Go. My 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 uh, advice is to go now when you're young. Uh, my most wonderful memories are with, for example, the semi-nomadic penance in Sarawak, uh, in Malaysia, doing and uh, doing community work with the Muruts in in Kaba. So uh, my community work in remote areas for 17 years. Uh, helped me become more resilient, more knowledgeable on indigenous issues, and really. The, to distinguish between what what is right, what uh, you know, and and what we should uh, bring uh, or demand at the international level. Um, so basically, I I think that's what I have when it comes to the international level. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the second question about participation of youth in national politics for indigenous peoples. Um, when we talk about politics, often people think about party politics and um, we, we often get mixed response. Uh, many young people are quite fed up uh, of uh, corrupt and ineffective governments. And uh, it's very easy to, to target, uh, to get angry with politicians in general. Uh, we may not be, an, an, or just lose faith in politics or involvement in national politics. Others, uh, other young people may think, wow, you know, uh, being, being a politician is great. That would be an opportunity to, you know, uh, for, to be there in power. Uh, others think that that's where your source of money <laughs> uh, would be. But, um, but to me, uh, participation in politics is, uh, uh, is very important. It's not just to, to oppose government and politician in power. Uh, because this is not everyone's cup of tea, uh, and there are very few who wants to to be involved. Um, there are there are more to national politics than exposing corrupt politicians and government. It's actually a process of uh, changing our political systems to fight for a better future, for in, especially for indigenous people. So for indigenous youths, uh, I hope. Uh, that will be your, you know, you will be inspired to change, uh, to want to change the system, uh, 
many people now, you know, going through our political uh, upheaval just few, few, these last few days uh, in Malaysia uh, has been, you know, like a lot of people say, oh, forget it, no, but for indigenous peoples in particular, I think it's so important for us to change system and earn respect for who we are as indigenous peoples. For so long, you know, we have faced discrimination, we face marginalization at the uh, social, economic, cultural and political level. Uh, our way of life as indigenous peoples, our lands, territories and resources uh, are not respected by governments and the dominant society too. So we, we struggle you know, to uh, also so uh, as uh, you know, elders and people who have gone through this uh, struggle for uh, a long time, uh, we want to transmit, you know, we want to transmit our culture, we want to transmit our uh, traditional knowledge to the next generation. But we are constantly battling in our own community, in ourselves, um, because there are so many outside influences and we debate the relevance uh, of our culture, you know, our traditional systems in the modern world. So that's why for me, it is uh, uh, for young people, uh, we are getting old. <laughs> so, you know, like to be involved in national politics, to change the policies of, uh, that we have now, the, the corrupt systems uh, in, in, uh, towards uh, indigenous peoples. My experience, for example, uh, of, uh, you know, how long, uh, the changing of policies. One particular example I have is um, the marriage, me fixing the, the marriageable age to, to 18 years old, because as indigenous peoples in Sabah, and I think many, in many countries in the world, um, there is no particular age uh, in which, where, uh, of marriage. So here uh, with the, you know, uh, the the yeah the uh, the age at the UN fixing it at eighteen below that uh, uh, is a child considered a child so my experience here in trying to change the law uh, has not been easy but once I was in government we were able to you know bring together the UN agencies NGOs government together and they were able to uh, analyze uh, we what whether 18 is an age that we should fix and make it into a law it's not so easy I, we find that we have to go through cabinet we have to go through the government and then to the national assembly to try and uh, change that uh, we met with a lot of uh, resistance and challenges uh, even by indigenous peoples themselves so to to do that is uh, it, it took us quite a long time and, and we have to put it in law. So, you know, the, everything has to be done. So if one, uh, if the young people, I find it very happy to see the, the girl guides, you know, in the schools, they, they came out, they had, you know, uh, songs, they had uh, posters uh, in, and many more uh, to, to uh, help in this campaign. And I was very touched that uh, they, they were able to do that. Often we cannot, you know, as uh, politicians, we cannot go to the school or just maybe an NGO cannot go to the school because it's so strict. But uh, the girl guides are already in the schools. So they were willing to, to talk about this. And I think that, that created the change in society and, and, and managed to convince, uh, you know, people in general that it is that the law uh, uh, it's important for the law to be to be fixed to 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 have this limit age limit. There are many more. Like I I was involved in, uh, for example, uh, in uh, one of the the Human Rights Commission doing the uh, uh, you know investigation. Uh, doing investigation uh, on uh, land, uh, you know, uh, uh, dispossession of land of indigenous peoples and it was used we have not been uh, it was uh, not so successful but uh, it, it's something that we continue to work on so um, you know we can have more pro indigenous peoples policies on land and we can use uh, international instruments um, for example we use the un declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples the uh, you know ILO 169 and many others uh, on the rights to development that uh, 
can be used so that, you know, free prior informed consent and many of these principles that are already adopted uh, in international law can be brought at home. Um, so once again, I just want to stress that we do young people, youths have a role to play uh, because they're very, uh, you know, proficient in the social media, especially. Uh, and, and so it's very easy to communicate. It's very easy to pro, uh, give uh, information. It can travel faster and it can be, you know, you have a lot more uh, learnings from other countries that we can rely on. So um, I don't know whether, uh, I think I stop there for now. Uh, thank you, uh, William, or, uh, for, for this time and also for everyone else to, for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a lot of indigenous people when they gather, they are willing to come in and share. It helps to synthesize ideas and demands. So as a person, we grow to be able to listen to others, plans, actions, statements of others. Thank you, mom, for your nice sharing with us. So I hope our youth are very inspired after listening to you. So yeah, uh, welcome to mom Joan Carling. You are with us. Uh, welcome with us. Uh, now, I would like to invite Mr. Gam Ashibre, Secretary General of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, to share with us his historical background of becoming a global leader for the indigenous movement by overcoming various obstacles and challenges and provide a future picture of indigenous peoples. Yeah. Welcome, sir. That's over to you. Thank you. Yeah, good evening to all of you. And thank you very much, William. Um, it was indeed quite a refresher and a pleasure to hear uh, Jenny sharing her experiences. <laughs> and um, first, before I go ahead, I just want to apologize that I won't be able to stay for the whole program. Um, <clears throat> but you are in good hands of many people. So, uh, <laughs> Apologies for that. But yes, while thinking about what to share here and the questions that you have put, I thought, yes, I will try to reflect myself when I was a youth. And in my youth life, perhaps what kind of questions and what kind of experiences uh, changed me? You are talking about inspiration and leadership and so on. And perhaps my experience, if at all, could also be something that you might find it relevant. Uh, in the, at the beginning, I, I just want to say that in the IBP itself, there has been quite a few leaders uh, and also from the communities and also as the IBP that has have had a lot of impact on me. <clears throat> For example, I know I also worked very closely with uh, Jenny. She is somebody I have always looked up uh, and being very wise when it comes to practical matters and practical actions. <clears throat> and that's how I learned a lot from her as well. And also the Louis, um, the first sec gen, he was, for example, very good in deep inquiry on, into issues and, you know, helping the people to uh, navigate oneself into deeper questions, therefore deeper self-realization that also was very inspirational. And I also work with Joanne, who is also is here with us. <clears throat> she is a strong leader who is very keen and always very determined in terms of taking very bold steps and so on. So all these are combinations, of course, that always shape somebody. And I'm just saying as an example that <laughs> there are many ways when we look at leadership and all these are experiences with whom I work very closely in some way or the other have also uh, influenced me. Now to begin with, I just want to go back a little bit to my youth life, the context in, under which I was brought up of course, it was a situation where I was born and brought up in a very 
um, intense conflict situation, military conflict, just like in, in Bangladesh that most of you also must be facing the same. Now in that, what we see is of course, full of destruction. Destruction in terms of life, property, your institutions, customary institutions and so on. Everything upon which we depend our life on is being destroyed in front of your eyes. And therefore, kind of a chaos, kind of this kind of very gloomy kind of experience just descends over you. And that's not very easy to overcome uh, that kind of uh, challenges. Eventually you begin to question yourself. Um, I have lost a lot of my very, very close families and relatives, uh, people have died and so on. I didn't grow up watching cartoons and so on, like a normal kid, which you also must be experiencing. So all these have very, very deep, profound impacts on all of us. And it's not so easy, our journey. Now, but fortunately for me, and this is a place where sometimes out of 365 days in a year, almost 300 days are closed and schools don't operate and so on. So where do you learn? Your institutions are destroyed. And even in the government institutions, it hardly functions. So where do you go No, I was therefore sent in a boarding school. Um, fortunately, I got a scholarship. That time it was called the Northeastern Council. But that scholarship was, or military in military school. So the irony is that I went to a school where it is precisely that same institutions that is destroying our <laughs> life back home. It was an irony, but I nevertheless went there. Education that I got there, as you know, is everything to do with, to cut me off from my roots, from my identity, to take away all those kind of things uh, that is supposed to have shaped my self, my identity. Uh, so it was kind of a huge conflicting uh, situation. Nevertheless, every year I would be going back to my village. And I still remember at the age of six, seven, eight, I still remember already participating in community activities, whether it's festival or any kind of programs. And me as a youth, boys and girls, we had our own role. We were all very active as the youth uh, in the village and we had different age groups within the youth itself and we were within that youngest group. And I remember elders coming, you know, with mix of humor, mix of seriousness, just to check on, you know, without much interference, how we are planning and if there is possibility for any advice. So we would normally go gathering water or firewoods. And if our plan is in a deep jungle and may not be safe or may not be the right place, they will say, oh, you, maybe you better go there. There are firewoods available and you know, uh, it will be easier and so on. So I would, we would go like that and we would participate in the community activities. This is just an example in various forms. Somehow my participation in the community life uh, had a very deep imprint in me as well. So my education and experience in the community was always conflicting. Meaning that I began to wonder, should things be like this, you know? Should, uh, are we, Will really so uh, such savages that we need to be civilized, we need to be tamed in such violent manner. These kind of questions uh, were always uh, something that kept hovering in my mind. Then in my university days, of course, I came across many things and I knew that something is wrong. I did not accept that. And therefore something must change uh, was something that I realized. But then what must change and how should things change is also again, a big question. Then I came across a story uh, in Africa, 
is also about oppression, suppression, and so on. This is a sh very short story. So it's a story which goes something like a community, nomadic community was traveling in a caravan. When they were traveling, some bandits or gangsters overtook them. And the gang gangsters took this caravan in the direction that they want. So they deviated from the original route in which this community was traveling. After a period of time, as time went by, the community discussed we, uh, and they also felt that things must change. And they staged a kind of a revolt. And they were finally able to overpower these gangsters. And finally, they took control of it. After they took control of it, they realized that they don't know where they were because they had deviated the direction in which the community was going. It was, things were no longer the same. So some in the community argued that we have to continue as we are going because we have lost our direction. And some says, no, this is not where we were going. This is not our worldview, this is not our vision. So some argue that we must go back to the place from where this deviation took place. And some argue that no, time has passed, things have changed. Why should we go back at that time? We, we cannot go back in time. This was a sort of argument of this story. That story kind of really struck me and inspired me to think in a much more deeper way. And in many ways, therefore, I realized also that without going back, at least in my imagination and recovering something of what really is my roots, my identity, what is the meaning of my participation that I recall uh, when I was young and continue to still participate. What does all those things mean? You know, can I still recover something that will shape and take me in the direction that I want or that my people want? This is the kind of question. This led me to a lot of, of course, learnings in the process. Now this learning began really when I began to accept that things have to change. I have to believe that things must change. And it cannot change, I think, if we don't believe that things can change, even if we know what the problem is. Right? So I also learned that failure, as the old saying goes, that failure is the pillar of success. I think this is a universal axiom that stands uh, to be true uh, in our life. So what this means is that failure means it's not about a destructive action. But perhaps for most of us, the experience is when we fail, we learn what is really deep uh, uh, and, uh, and effective learning happens uh, in many of our life. But what this failure means is that we learn from it in a, so it leads to an effective learning. It means it is a realization of something meaningful and internalizing the new meaning that gives us and shapes us into something different and makes us move forward. Now, this means that we must learn to effectively fail, not just fail for the sake of failing and we keep destroying things, no? But determined and in search of solutions that we're looking for. And if that is clear, I think we aim high we are clear with our goals. And then in that process, we will learn from our failures. And those learning becomes very effective and deep and shapes us something like a new person. And in this also, what I learned is that, yes, I have many idols, many people who inspired me. I try to imitate my parents. I imit try to imitate many of these leaders or people that have inspired me. But that is just an imitation. It is, more importantly is, I have to shape myself. I must become who I am. So my identity as an individual is also different. So I stopped comparing myself to others. 
I'm inspired by many people, but I do not compare myself with others. I compare myself to myself. What this means is that each day I try to reflect if I have moved a step forward. If I have done things better today than yesterday, am I better today than how I was yesterday? These kind of questions. And this is accessible to everyone. So that gives you the satisfaction and the motivation to move forward. If you compare yourself with a rich person or a successful person, and you cannot become that person, it only leads to jealousy. It only leads to uh, self-degeneration. That is something I think is a very important turning point uh, as far as I am concerned. Now, lastly, I just want to speak about leadership. I think this is how day by day we become a leader. Leaders are not made in a day, right? But what is important is that leadership should not become indispensable. Leadership should play its role, but it should not be indisp in indispensable, for example, in any organization or for any country for that matter. Otherwise, what happens is it becomes like the dictators. Dictators will keep saying that, okay, if I remove and give the leadership to others, it will collapse, there'll be chaos, there'll be bloodshed, and then it continues. And we have seen also in many a times where in some organization, one leader is there for a lifetime. We have seen that. What I mean to say is that if we have to look at it this way, that leadership should not be indispensable, it means that we must build leadership. We must diversify leadership. There has to be a distributed leadership. So for example, the reason why do we build youth platforms is because so that leadership platforms are provided for the youth to play the leadership role and to groom itself through self-learning and from learning from many other things like Jenny has explained. So that is the kind of platform, for example, we build and we need to build for the women, for the youth and for others so that leadership is diversified, uh, leadership is distributed, uh, this kind of uh, things. But one important thing that we should ask is what constitutes indigenous leadership? Where does it, where from where does it draw its leg, uh, legitimacy, right? And the question we should also be asking is, do our indigenous leadership uh, permeates and is practiced in our organizations? Or are we just romanticizing and is it just a rhetoric and is it really being truly applied? Because application is the challenge. And that is where we need to have that wisdom and the know-how of how we do it. And that are the points that we must reflect any platform, any leadership that we create you know, to make it meaningful, yes? And we must question whether this leadership is advancing, supporting, energizing the network, the organizations, is it fulfilling the goals, the vision of indigenous uh, struggle objective uh, 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 and so on. Then, we must also be, I think one important thing that we need to be asking today in Asia is we seem to be losing a lot of this leadership of where the collective power, the power to make collective decisions about our future, about our community and of our plannings. That collective decision-making power is I think uh, one of the main challenges that I see today where we must constantly be reflecting and uh, be trying to uh, address. Now, why I raise this is because our struggle is not just about our struggle to take control. Our right to self-determination is just not about taking control of our land, territories and resources. Just like I was giving you the example of the story of the caravan. We will face this, how do we move forward after we take control, right? So our struggle leadership was what we need to reflect is that um, it's also um, about remaking our future in our own designs. 
But what is this design that we are trying to create is something that we must be pondering and working on now. Not only at the time when we take control of things and be faced with the kind of a monumental challenge of a, a chaotic uh, situation. So our struggle is about uncovering, recovering, and reclaiming indigenous uh, uh, sovereignty. And that means it is about our worldviews, our values, and principles that makes us indigenous. Yes, because we are the sovereign over this and no one else. That values and principles, what we keep talking about, whether it's in environment or governance, about reciprocity, about sharing, about caring for nature, a community, being in community with our environment, all these kinds of uh, uh, values, the reciprocity, all these things, reconciliation. These are something that we possess. These are something that we can reclaim. And these are the ones that we are sovereign over. So it is a struggle to really reclaim, recover these things and reclaim. Now with the last point that I want to end is that in the indigenous values and principles, the sovereign that we point that we have to emphasize. To me, it's really what is important is uh, love. Now I'm not saying this in a ro romantic sense. No? We all long for something and very deep, of course, and we feel very strongly. Well, you might say that, okay, I found my girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, this is the person or something that I want to give everything for. And then one year later, you might realize that it is the disaster of your life. <laughs> it was a wrong choice, decision, whatever. But the point is that the love for my community, the love of my participation in the way that things were done when I was young and that shaped me. That is what constitutes my roots. And that is the passion, the motivation, the love of my identity, the roots and my participation in the community and how community work together and shape one another. This is the love that I'm uh, talking about. Do you have the love to be sharing something with another person? Do you have the love for that person that you are able to sacrifice? Because there is a demand for sacrifice in our struggle. That is why indigenous peoples always emphasize reconciliation. Reconciliation is about working towards the future because it's talking about forgiveness. And it is not possible without this kind of values and principles that we uh, kind of uphold and embody. You know? So to me, it is uh, this, uh, the love for our community life, our rootedness and how we work together and share everything. That is something I must say that really shaped me and continues to motivate me in everything uh, that I do. Um, I will end here, uh, thank you. William, um, I do hope that it does. I hope there is some sense for at least to some extent for all of you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, that the leaders are not met in a day, but what is important is leadership should play its role, but uh, should not be essential application is the challenge that is the action of wisdom we must learn how to questions is leadership effective enough thank you sir thank you for your nice sharing and speech with us i hope our young people they are happy to hear you here so thank you so much sir uh, thank you again so now I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Joan Carlin, co convener Indigenous Peoples Major Group for the SDGs, former General Secretary, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, and a former member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, to share with us uh, her historical background of becoming a global women leader for the Indigenous movement by overcoming various obstacles and challenges 
and the uh, importance of participation in decision making and policy making process of national and intergovernmental agencies. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, floor is yours. Now it's over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm. Uh, it's it's a, a pleasure to hear from Jenny and and Gam. Uh, we were. We are all together in the Asian Indigenous uh, Peoples Pact. And I'm also uh, so happy to see all this is young in Indigenous. It's also encouraging for us, the older generation, to know that the uh, Indigenous youth are stepping up. And I, I hope uh, many of you will be engaged in the long term in, in relation to advancing the indigenous peoples movement uh, in the region in asia but also at the at the global level now uh, with regards to my historical background uh, i'm i started as an activist and i actually started as a student activist which probably many of you are and i hope you are at, at, uh, at uh, in your stage now but as a, as a student uh, activist, I, I, I learned uh, uh, particularly about the struggle of indigenous peoples against the dams, uh, that was the Chico Dam uh, at that time. And, and, and so it was a successful struggle because they were able to stop um, this, this project that was funded by, by the World Bank. But it has encouraged me to see the communities that have spearheaded this struggle. So I, I, I went there during the summer break as a student uh, to see uh, and to, to join uh, what was then known as the Makliing Memorial. It was the memorial for the leader that was killed, uh, the leader of the anti Chico Dams uh, that was killed. No? Uh, so. So it was a big eye opener for me to, to really uh, see the, 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 the situation of tribal communities um, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the province, but also it has um, given me the, it inspired me to, to see the strength and, 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 and resoluteness of them to give up their life, to protect their land uh, and their dignity. And, and that was really, that was, that was a turning point. Uh, many people think that the, 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 the indigenous communities are poor, they are very, you know, they, they, uh, they are not happy or, or that they need help. But in this situation, they don't, they were happy uh, in, in, their, in their daily life. It was simple life, but they feel they have the dignity because they were in control of their life, they're in they they govern themselves, and and they and they and they work hard for something to to feed, not to 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 feed their families, and they're able to do their rituals, they're able to celebrate, and so when the, the when the dam project came in, that was really a serious threat to them, right? So they really women, youth, uh, elders came together. Uh, and they really worked uh, in, in unity to, to protect their, their, their land with their life. And they won. They won. And that was a big eye opener also to the World Bank. In fact, that was the reason why the World Bank developed their uh, indigenous people's policy. That was the context of why the World Bank developed their indigenous people's policy, because it was clear that the project is violating the collective rights of indigenous peoples over their lands and resources. And if that is taken away, they will sacrifice their life. Uh, so so uh, having learned that and having seen that their dignity as people is not coming from material wealth, for me, that was a very important lesson. But if these people are going to sacrifice their life to uphold their dignity, their cultural integrity, the way they think, the way they regard land, the way they, they, they regard their rivers, their rice fields, and who am I, <laughs> who am I, right? Not to be with them and not to stand by them. 
And as an indigenous youth at that time, that was really like, that, that, that was uh, when it inspired me to take on these issues and start working with communities. So after college, I actually went back to the province to work with the tribal communities. And at that time, it was the height of militarization. So I, 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 we were, we, I, I was organizing fact-finding missions to areas that were banned by the military. And it was a big eye-opener for me again, that uh, because we went to a village, a tribal village that were complete, they were just, they were not only banned, but their houses were burned to the ground, the whole village literally so all their artifacts you can see their their antique jars broken so nobody was there and when we reached the area that's when they from from the forest came out to 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 meet the team the fact finding team and 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 they were desperate they were desperate to harvest their 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 uh their uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, but they were forbidden, no? So they were, and, and their children, the, some of their children were in high school and they need to send their, the, 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 some stipend for their children. And they don't have any source if they cannot harvest their products. So they actually begged me to talk to the military to allow them to harvest even just for one or two days. And, and, you know, I did not have any experience at that time, but I just have to, because it, the situation calls for it, right? So I really went, talked to the, to the lieutenant at the time, the, the military officer, and, and, and begged that they should allow the, the, the community to, to, uh, to harvest their, their, their crops. And uh, it, it was, well, because the lieutenant was young and then they said, well, from where are you? And then I was telling her I'm from this. So he was a bit like flirting. So I had to sort of, you know, go along just to, for him to allow the, 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 the especially the women, it was the women begging uh, to allow them to go, to go. And, and, and he did finally, he agreed. So they were really happy that they were finally able to, but these are the situation that, that, that I was dealing with. And because there were series of, 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 of things like that, it was too much for me emotionally and mentally that, that we decided to seek counseling because it was the, the helplessness of communities, right? It's just so overbearing. The lack of justice is just so overbearing that it, you cannot already sleep in the night thinking about these people. So we had to undergo some counseling on how do we overcome that feeling so that we can continue to work with the, with the communities because some are already giving up, right? Because it was just too much. But, but you're in the middle of like the, the Philippine government declaring a total war against the, the, communi the, 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 you know, the rebels who are in indigenous communities. And it was the indigenous communities suffering from all this uh, militarization. So for me, that also honed my understanding of, of human rights of, for, because that was really what was happening. No? They were arresting and, and, and putting people in jail, killing and, 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 and um, and uh, torture uh, and, and torture and, and harassment and all of those. That was the, the situation. And it's not easy to deal with those kind of situations. Uh, also at that time when we, I, I was also uh, visiting or bringing families of those in jail to visit them you know, in, in jail. And that's again, another traumatic, if I may, traumatic experience because you see how families were broken because of, uh, of, 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 the, of the father being in jail and, and the children gr growing up without their father, right? So, so I, as an activist, I mean, that, that really grounded me in this kind of, of reality. And, and, and so I, I continued working uh, with, with mining and dumps and then it, it became clear that these are impositions with international connection because the ones giving the funds 
funds for these projects are outside the Philippines. Another dam project came in, which was Dan Roque Dam, funded by, by Japanese. And then, uh, and then uh, a lot of mining companies were coming in from, from, uh, from companies from the US, UK, Australia. So we then need to reach out to these countries to say, hey, you're violating the rights of indigenous people. So you're trampling upon people who are actually, who has conserved these resources, not for themselves, but for the future generations. And here you come to take it away and even leave all the waste, like mining waste, pollution and everything. So we need to tell that story in the outside world that they cannot allow, like the Japanese people cannot allow their, Japanese, the, their government or Japanese companies to come in and violate the rights of people. That, that is not just discrimination, that is racism. Because how can they, you know, exploit other people for them to become wealthy, right? That's uh, that's the the, the complete uh, in, injustice. So that also brought me to the international stage because I have to deal with them to tell them that they are violating the rights of communities. No, so so th that is where I'm. I I I you know my my. As, as you say, how I became a, a, a woman leader up to the, the global level. And, but, but I just want to share some important lessons before, um, before uh, the, the issue on the, the importance of, of participating in decision-making. I think the lesson that we should take in at heart is when we go international or even at the national and local, we have to make sure that we are grounded. We are grounded by the realities of communities in terms of how their rights are being respected or violated, but also to recognize that these people are not just vulnerable. Indigenous communities are not helpless. They are not just you know, communities that are wanting uh, outsiders to come in and improve their lives. It's not like that for indigenous communities. Like, like I mentioned to you, they're happy exercising their, as Gam said, their right to self-determine their own governance, their own culture, right? But at the same time, they're building their resilience. It's actually the, 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 those coming from the outside that are actual, uh, uh, um, uh, dividing or weakening the systems. And that has that message has to be delivered at different levels, right? So when we engage at the international level, this is what we are bringing, right? It's not, you know, not just general whatever, but really the realities on the ground and how communities are actually using their knowledge, using their cooperation to address their situation. Then also um, that, that uh, and, 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 and finally, that there are, we always combine different strategies in different levels. We cannot just have one form of strategy. We need awareness raising, we need alliance building, we need advocacy, we need to build trust, we need to build relations, we have to bring the youth, we have to bring the women, we have to bring also the voice of the persons with disabilities. We need everyone. We, we have to involve everyone. And we need to listen to the different perspectives. Youth have their own kind of aspirations. They are creative and we need to listen to that. But also women have a different perspective because they have a nurturing and caring work and, and knowledge. And that has to be brought in, especially in situations of conflict, right? Women are actually in the forefront of conflict transformation because they suffer the most in relation to conflicts. So we need to give value to different perspectives, but also be clear on what is the common aspiration. And we move forward with that by bringing everybody on board because we cannot do it alone, right? 
So we also need to strengthen solidarity among different uh, organizations and, and indigenous peoples, non-indigenous peoples, and bring that solidarity at higher levels from local, national, global, and, and global levels. And finally, just to conclude on the issue of uh, participation in decision-making, uh, the importance of this, like, like I said, if women are not participating in decision-making, if youth are not participating in decision-making, then that means we do not have them on board if our actions are right and that we will not be able to account for the specific needs and aspirations and perspectives of youth and women. So the importance of participating in decision-making is that we're able to express and present our own views, especially as indigenous peoples. The, 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 like for example, when we're dealing with the environment, right? We always carry a, a reciprocal relations uh, with nature, with everything uh, in, our, in, 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 in our environment. And, and so if, if, for example, they want to cut down the trees, right? Because they look at the trees only with the value of timber. But when we participate in decision-making and tell them, wait, that tree is not just timber. That tree provides food for animals. That tree gives water for the rice fields. So we give that perspective. We give a more holistic valuation of things, not just the commercial value where a lot of decisions are being made because one sector wants econo their economic interest over our resources, right? And so we need to tell them, wait a minute, the value of that resource is beyond economic terms, right? Women rely on that. The youth, the future of the youth relies on those resources. So that is the importance of, of, of uh, participation in decision-making. And so we need to find and develop and assert spaces and create the spaces where we can participate in decision-making. Because if we are not on the table, then our voices will not be there. Then our perspectives will not be considered and our aspirations will not also be taken on board. Uh, so uh, I, I finally, it's, it's uh, just to say my last words in, in relation to indigenous youth that in the indigenous uh, uh, movement now, our future relies on you. Of that decision you make now will affect the future of indigenous peoples. And I hope you take the right decision to be part of the indigenous movement and take the leading role uh, that, that is based on indigenous values of accountability, of selflessness, of building solidarity and cooperation, because these are the values that will bring us in the right direction. And in, in a way that we can advance our vision as indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, listening to you uh, very carefully. It's really uh, enrichable and enlightening us. So thank you so much, ma'am, for your uh, nice sharing and speech. Thank you. Uh, I think our another guest speaker, Mrs. Shushan, uh, she will uh, she will not uh, join us. I think she has another emergency meeting. So, yeah, um, our all our participants. If you have questions to our three speakers, so it's uh, floor is open now. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and you can talk or you can send a message in our chat also. Yeah. Thank you. I'm 
so one comments from Assam, Mr. Motiur, uh, Mr. Motiur Rahman. Mr. Moti Rahman, are you here? Yes, yes. <clears throat> I'm from Assam. Uh, we are day to day marginalized as because of main problem of Assam, of indigenous people, is the influx problem from neighboring country, Bangladesh and Nepal. So, uh, in our uh, Assam, <clears throat> Ruler they have in the, in, in the parliament also. So we are suffering a lot. So we ask the global community, all the indigenous groups of different countries, please help us in this regard. As because of uh, we are fighting uh, for the for our rights, and uh, we appeal in the Supreme Court also, but. Court is also now silent. Uh, no final decision is yet taken. So uh, we are in a great danger situation. So in this situation, uh, if uh, our Asia organization or the other uh, indigenous organization can help us, then we can uh, proceed and then we can um, uh, solve the problem of influx. And we want implementation of UNRIP also, but uh, we appeal in the Supreme Court to instruct the government of India for implementation of UNRIP in Assam, but it is also hanging now. So no uh, final decision not yet taken. And for the uh, COVID situation, the open hearing of the Supreme Court is also stopped. So we are in a great trouble. Please, in this regard, I have written uh, different uh, uh, in, uh, in this line, I have uh, written uh, clearly uh, yesterday to the organization. So just I am appeal to all that uh, we are the indigenous communities and the races of Assam are we are in a great dangerous situation and we are going to be outnumbered, marginalized. Our uh, indigenous women and men also not represent in the assembly and the parliament, uh, we are totally deprived our own indigenous rights, our land rights, our water rights, in every respect, in every field, we are, we are lost, we are losing like anything. So I appeal everybody, please, please look into the matter and please help us in this regards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mathur. Yeah, Mom, uh, would you like to respond to Mr. Mathur? Maybe, maybe I say a few words in relation to our topic today, if you allow. And I think, um, you know, especially um, uh, it was said, no, uh, that uh, I think many indigenous peoples everywhere in the world are experiencing. Uh, this kind of <clears throat> marginalization, even conflict and uh, a very serious uh, situation. Um, but uh, going back, you know, for example, you were saying not represented politically. And this is where I think even as indigenous peoples, we have tried to, uh, we must aspire to, to, go, to go there. So we must try to, to build among ourselves uh, a political alliances, uh, you know, maybe leaders who can eventually uh, go into politics, <laughs> talking uh, about myself now. I mean, we, we may feel helpless and unrepresented in uh, national uh, parties. It doesn't matter, I think, in the beginning, uh, whether we are aligned to any political uh, parties, whether they're in government or opposition, but uh, consider if young people start considering uh, politics being there and you know joining them um, also developing uh, good uh, leaders for example speakers uh, at the community because many of us uh, I find um, are change um, 
because there are just we just need one person who who give uh, false information, new sentiments, and we we go to, to vote for them. You know, this is a, actually our golden opportunity uh, during political, uh, you know, uh, example during elections to 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 put out our voice. Uh, in many countries now, of course, they now have uh, indigenous parties. That might not be the the solution for us, but um, you know we 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 have to go there. We have to to be brave enough uh, to to have young people going in, start now talking. You know, their community educators and communicators, so that you know we we are not played by sentiments. We are not played by dirty politics, and 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 then uh, step by step we we will get there. But I think. Um, start now. There are many young people here. I know the speaker is uh, probably already uh, older himself, but we, we won't get anywhere by just you know looking at the situation. Uh, we, of course, we many of you are already in, involved in uh, internationally, maybe writing to the special rapporteur or you know other uh, other ways to do it. But at the local level, this is my experience that we can do. And of course, there will be frustration, but we, we cover all levels. And I think as uh, indigenous peoples, we will get there. We, we, we cannot lose hope. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, luckily, our uh, guest speaker, uh, Mrs. Shushan is with us. So yeah, now I would like to invite our um, uh, third speak, uh, speaker, Mrs. Vizeshushan, to share with us uh, share with us about the opportunity for indigenous youths at the United Nations level and present futures plan of UNESCO to strengthen the Asia Indigenous Youth Platform in Asia. So, yeah, floor is yours, Mrs. Shushan. And thank you, ma'am, for your answer uh, responding to Mr. Mathieu. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we will uh, we will uh, again ask our young people to ask for questions. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. My, uh, my apologies for being late. Um, yes, hello everybody. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, I guess uh, I would like to just share with you uh, a few thoughts from from my perspective. Uh, working for the UN and uh, what we've been doing with Indigenous youth. Uh, and I think firstly, there are not that many specific opportunities for Indigenous youth in the UN. And I think that's actually an issue. Uh, I think a lot of the opportunities for youth that exist are mainstreamed in that there's no specific opportunity particularly aimed at young Indigenous youth. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to start some specific engagement with Indigenous youth to try to overcome this. I think it's very difficult for Indigenous youth to join a lot of these mainstream opportunities because they don't actually acknowledge or accept the realities for Indigenous youth. The main avenue of engagement is actually through the Indigenous Peoples Forum, which is a, a global level. Um, network of Indigenous people that work with the UN and there is a thing called the major major groups and there is one for Indigenous people is not specific to youth. There's a similar major group specific to youth but not for Indigenous youth and it's quite easy therefore for Indigenous youth to fall into a category that doesn't really align with anything specific in the UN and um, th this is this is problematic because how do you engage if you're an Indigenous youth? It's actually not so easy. So the Asia Indigenous Youth Platform that we've been trying to set up or we have set up in partnership with AIPP is to try to provide an avenue for Indigenous youth to create their own space about how they want to engage. It's not just necessarily with the UN, it could be with governments, it could be with NGOs, it could be with you know, anybody else. And the idea there is the space is specifically for Indigenous youth to think about the issues for them. What are their challenges? What are their opportunities? What are the skills and capacities they need to build to be able to engage? 
and then what are the key messages that they want to promote or what is what is the the thing that they want to um take out to the world and raise, uh, raise awareness about, take action on, etc. cetera. Um, so this platform will go through a series of uh, national level groups, but we hope that it's open to all young Indigenous people to engage, to follow on Facebook, to be involved in activities, etc. as it moves forward. Um, so we've created the space and now we're working on building that space. So at the moment, um, the main area of focus is on trying to create a structure that young people can manage this space for themselves. And then in parallel to the structure and the governance to try to create an opportunity for action. So we've had really good partnership with UNDP. UNDP has um, been trying to create space for young Indigenous entrepreneurs. Uh, we haven't had a lot of other engagement or traction with other UN agencies in the region yet. So, you know, we're really looking for young Indigenous people to follow this, to, um, to share their experiences, to uh, identify the issues that they face and to be involved in developing their own solutions that are designed by them to meet the issues that they face. And this is actually really important because Indigenous youth are the ones that know what the issues are and they should therefore be involved in creating the responses to deal with those. So we, we really like to um, create a space that young people are leading the way. We're there to support. AIPP is there to support but we really want young people to make the decisions, identify the issues, lead the actions to respond to those. So that's what the platform is about. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, lots of young Indigenous people will join it. It is limited geographically in terms of the scope of the countries that are covered um, aligns with the AIPP membership. So for young Indigenous people that aren't from Southeast Asia and South Asia, um, I, I guess we should be looking at more avenues to create uh, networks and, and ways for them to also be able to uh, support their activities, participate in the mainstream, but also have their own space. And I think it's really important that part where they have their own space. Um, so I think I'll leave it there and I, I guess I can take questions if anyone has questions. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, madam, uh, for your sharing. So now, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask or raise your hand or you can uh, send your uh, questions in our chat also. So floor is open. Any questions from young people to our honorable speakers? Maybe while they're um, getting up their courage or ideas for a question, I'll give one example of what the, uh, the platform has been able to do so far. So we started a, a program of grants for the Indigenous youth last year to enable them to support their communities to respond to COVID. And this enabled uh, around 10 Indigenous youth uh, networks. So they didn't have to be an NGO or a specific group. They could be a, a group of friends or, a, an, or an NGO. Um, they started their own projects. And the projects were, um, they were quite varied depending on the countries. In Indonesia, we had a group of young people helping kids who couldn't go to school to be able to do their schoolwork. In Bangladesh, uh, a quite different approach was one where they were actually training youth to be able to create new livelihoods to support their families during the COVID uh, crisis. So this was one uh, idea that the Indigenous youth came up with of the kind of things that they need to support 
themselves and their communities and they were able to conduct these projects with the support from AIPP and UNESCO. And um, there are some videos and various other materials and I will share them with you, William, so that you can also extend those to the wider network. Thank you, Madam. Uh, we don't have enough time, so if you have any questions, you can ask or not. Maybe uh, I will. I I would like to invite our guest uh, speakers to give their final uh, message to us. Already, you shared a lot of uh, experience with us, so please uh, share with us uh, your feelings or something with us. So then we will close our webinar today. Um, uh, I, it's a pleasure to be part of the you know sharing session uh, today and I hope that um, many uh, youths will be able to continue their uh, involvement uh, wherever they are uh, but I I think it's uh, we we talk most of us uh, game uh, have been more on the international scene, uh, but uh, and so I think there's a lot of uh, encouragement from us grounding at the level local level and and bringing it forward. And I think it has been really enriching for all of us. So I I do hope that if you're going on that uh, line, do uh, do continue. But also uh, for myself now in uh, politics, there's a lot of things also. I mean, I, I never thought that, you know, we struggle a long time in the, in the NGOs to be, uh, to encourage uh, people to be involved in politics. But um, all the policy work that we have, uh, or advocacy that we have done, you can make a difference there. It's, it's frustrating politics, but you, you can also be there uh, to change your, I think many of us, uh, uh, I really encourage young, young people to, uh, on that line uh, to even, you know, to, to test it out in your own. Try being, a, you know, a, a, local, a lead, local leader first, you know, uh, go for election if there's there. And, and then it's a try and error in life. It, there's nothing hard and fast rule and, and all this, but uh, the idea is not to, uh, you know, to feel down if things are, as again, saying failures are do uh, uh, we energy and a lot of, um, uh, I, uh, you know, continue, uh, and uh, never give up. So uh, we wish only to change uh, the world uh, for a better place for indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, message. Mama joining are you here? Yeah, uh, j just to be, and, and yeah, I, I echo what mentioned. And, and just to, to, to say that uh, indigenous youth of the end and potentials to contribute. So trust in yourself and believe in yourself that you can contribute in advancing uh, the rights, welfare and vision of indigenous peoples. So you have different options and you have different skills that, that you can use to be part of, 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 of this movement, to be part of any platform that will serve the interest of indigenous peoples and also strengthen your values as a part of uh, indigenous uh, people. So I hope that uh, you, you will live up to your identity as, as, uh, as, as part of indigenous peoples and take on the, the leadership uh, in the coming uh, years. And we look forward 
uh, to indigenous youth taking on the, the leadership and further advancing uh, the indigenous people's movement at all levels from local to national to regional and at the global levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Susan, Su. Uh, yeah, I guess um, they're great final sentiments from um, the other uh, speakers. I think what I would like to urge everybody is to remember to work together because you all have your own challenges, but you have common challenges. And when you work together, you can create, you, you know, you can support each other, you can share ideas, you can um, share the learnings that you have from all of these activities, and you can also build a stronger voice. And I think that this is really important. And this is one of the reasons why we want young Indigenous people to come together in their own space. So I think if, if I were to say one thing, it would be to, you know, you, you have a wealth of knowledge, you have a wealth of talents between you. And I think that if you try to uh, bring this together and use this as a group, you can actually make so much more impact for your own communities and for Indigenous communities on a wider scale. Yeah. Thank you, Mum. Thank you so much uh, for your message. So now I would like to thank our honorable speakers uh, for enlightening us with your knowledge and wisdom. So today's our webinar was full of knowledge and interesting things. So it gave a deep insight into the indigenous movement in Asia and globally also revealed some interesting facts. So also thank you to all the participants present here for paying your attention and learning. So thank you again and thank you Asia Indigenous Youth Platform and Bangladesh Indigenous Youth Forum to organize with us and overall Asia Indigenous People's Pact, GAM and Charu Vikash Dada and Sohel Chandra Hajung Dada and the team of AIPP and all of my colleagues from IMCS Asia Pacific and UNESCO Asia Pacific, thank you mom. And thank you, Mom Joan Carling, Mom Jenny Lasimbang. And uh, my, our, uh, we launch our uh, Insight of International Movement of Catholic Students, Insight of our movement. We launched uh, last week, uh, IMCS Indigenous People's Youth Commission. So Ms. Chandra Tripura as a mentor and uh, Mrs. Norma M. Mapagonos. Uh, she's also with us as an elder. So we need all of your support to uh, work for the indigenous students, since I am also indigenous uh, young boy. So I hope uh, we will get all of your support and cooperation in future. So thank you all. And uh, thank you again. So let's work together and build a just world for all. Thank you all. Uh, please take care and stay safe. Thank you. Good night. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice Thank you. Angie.